So good evening, everyone. My name is Samantha Hendricks. I'm the event coordinator here at Schuler Books and Nicholas Books. We have three locations in Michigan, one here in Grand Rapids, one in Okemos, and one in Ann Arbor. The store in Ann Arbor is Nicholas Books. If you are around that area, go check it out. Uh, this evening, we are here to talk with Sonia Hartle. She's going to be in conversation with Andrea Contos. We're so excited to have them both here. We're celebrating Sonia's newest book, um, Out by Page Street, The Lost Girls, A Vampire Revenge Story. Um, it came out on the 13th, but I know copies are still trickling in. So I dropped the link in the chat so you can get your signed copies if you haven't already. Um, and if you have, maybe grab one for a friend. So um, what drew me to this book is um, the description of a John Tucker must die uh, cross with a feminist vampire girlfriend. Like it's all the things guys, it's all the things and you should be so excited to read it. Um, so I'm gonna give you a quick introduction and then we'll get going. So India Cantos is our conversationalist this evening award-winning writer of young adult mysteries and thrillers. She's the author of Out of the Fire and Throwaway Girls. She grew up in Detroit, and thanks to the tours given by her policeman father, she can tell you exactly where the morgue is. That's terrifying. She currently lives outside the city with her tiny feminist daughters, her husband, and their very energetic puppy. And you can find her on Twitter, Instagram, and on her website, which we will post in the chat as well. And then, the author of the evening, Sonia Hartle, is the author of Not Your Hashtag Love Story, Have a Little Faith in Me, which received a starred review in Book Page and earned nominations for the Georgia's Peach Book Award, the YALSA's Quick Picks for Reluctant Readers, and ALA's Rise, a Feminist Book Project list. She's a member of SCBWI and the managing director of Pitch Wars 2020. When She's not writing or reading. She's enjoying pub trivia, marathoning Disney movies, or taking walks outside in the fall. She lives in Grand Rapids with her husband and their two daughters, and you can follow her on Twitter. All right, ladies, I'm going to leave it up to you. I'm going to step away, and I'll be back in about 20, 25 minutes, and we'll take all your questions then. Okay. All right, so... Like Samantha said, I'm Andrea, and I am super excited to be here tonight because Sonia happens to be one of my favorite people ever and also was my mentor in Pitch Wars, which actually led to my debut. So not only is she one of my favorite people, but she also is one of the reasons that I am even sitting here today. So super, super excited to be able to talk to her and more focused on her actual book that we're here to talk about today. It's one of my favorite origin stories, I think, out of any book ever. So I'm going to let Sonia kind of fill us in on, look, I printed this out old school. I'm not going to share my screen. Um, <laughs> but if you see those numbers, this little 105,000 likes, totally viral tweet. So kind of fill us in on exactly how this story happened. Um, so it started with, I was just messing around on Twitter as one does when they're supposed to be doing other things. And um, I was talking about, oh, I actually was just like, I want to, you know, read this vampire book, but I want it to be a little bit different. Like a hundred years after they turned for true love as teens. And now they're like fully over each other and um, they want out and they're done. And so my agent tweets back at me. She's like, you know, you could write this, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, I do write books. That's, <laughs> that's something I could probably do. So um, then I went into the group chat with this and I was like, you know, it looks like I'm going to be writing a vampire book now. <laughs> so um, as I started throwing the idea together, it just kind of came together as I thought it would be a lot more fun if it was like a revenge story, especially because um, most of my books have strong threads of female friendship in them and were important to me. So um, it kind of just bloomed from there. And I think like I've said this before, one of the things that I think related so well to people was just this concept of God, if you were stuck at 17 forever, all of those things that you don't even think about it, that would be such an annoyance. Like Holly's crim terror is one of my favorite elements in the entire book. So, I mean, how did you go about sort of crafting that world and coming up with the concepts and the very relatable things that probably people would not think about? 
Um, I think what, what I went into this when I went into this writing is that I wanted to kind of showcase that like the true horror isn't necessarily the vampires and you know the gore that comes along with that but being stuck at an age where you can't move on and you're not quite yet an adult but you're treated with adult burdens and expectations like so many teenage girls are and so Holly has to navigate the world on her own but she can't get like anything over a part-time you know job at a fast food restaurant she can't um you know put a down payment on an apartment um she can't like get (laughs) um you know move forward in life and do things that like a you know, typical adults start doing when, you know, they stop being teenagers. And so I thought it would be kind of interesting to, to kind of really showcase that frozen period in time, not just the, um, what do you call it? Like, not just like the physical aspects, but like the emotional aspects of it as well. So, so I did like make it manifest as like, you know, keeping her hairstyle from that time period. And, you know, there's a spot on her knee that she missed when she was shaving and she's stuck with that forever. But it's also like, not just the physical aspects, but the emotional aspects as well of staying that age forever. So um, I am actually going to flip this and ask you the same question Um, (laughs) or a similar question. Um, So like, you know what? We went out of order, I think. All right, never mind. I'm going to ask you the question that I have queued up next here on my sheet, which is like, okay, so when we're talking about like the vampire world that, that, you know, that I created and all of that, you also created a very vivid world in Out of the Fire. And it's, even though it's contemporary, it's still very atmospheric. And, uh, you know, I just want to know how you built that world based on the mood of your characters. Yeah. So, I mean, I think anytime I write anything and a lot of people are not big fans of description. Um, I think it's kind of critical. Uh, I, that scene setting to me makes such a huge difference. And it's, you know, one of those things that makes the difference between your book being called cinematic and not, right? Is that if you set this scene of what things look like, I think it helps people immerse themselves in it and to sort of create this picture in their world. And so I, I do make a concerted effort to set that up in the tone and the mood that I want that scene to read. If it's a more lighthearted scene, then yeah, it's probably gonna be brighter and lighter and you know, things are fluffy and nice. Whereas if I'm going for something that's more somber, you're probably gonna get shadows and moonlight and, and you know, darkened trees against the backdrops and stuff. So I, I think regardless of contemporary or fantasy or no matter what it is, that world building I think is critical to any book and allowing readers to really set that scene in their head and just tumble into the book where they're no longer reading and they're just more experiencing. Awesome. So we talked a little bit about, you know, those more humorous aspects of being, you know, stuck at 17, unshaved knees and things like that. You know that I think you're one of the absolute most hilarious people I've ever met. And I loved that even though there were so many darker points in that book and so many areas that you delved into about things that teen girls experience on a daily basis there was always that humor and always those things that sort of balance out the story so why is it important for you do you think to make sure that that element is included um I think a lot of people and and myself including this has always been like the way that I am there's a large amount of people that deal with trauma through humor like it's it's just how you process it it's how you make it more uh, easier to deal with um and I think that even when you're dealing with heavier subjects or darker subjects it's okay to interject some humor into that because that is just how some people you know process it and I I've always all of my stories even when I'm dealing with much heavier topics will always have large doses of humor in them just because that's always how I've always I don't know, I guess Ben. <laughs> so um, let's see, what do I got up next for you? Um, aha. So here is something that I like about you is that you never lose sight of the fact that you're writing for teenagers and writing YA. And I would just want to know like for Out of the Fire, what elements were most important for you for teenagers to see? 
Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones for me was the friendship amongst the four girls and the way that they kind of come together to support each other. And it's so often that we see girls sort of pitted against one another and it becomes, you know, this very stereotyped, you know, this girl's part of this group and they become enemies or they have some sort of rivalry. And to be honest, I mean, I've, you know, my oldest daughter is 12. And so we're just sort of entering into the teen years. But even with that, I, I think really, not that those things don't happen, but so often I see girls coming together to support each other and to be there with each other. And I, I think it's important to showcase that and to show that that is incredibly normal, that there not be infighting and that girls can come and support each other and be there for each other, even when they disagree. Um, there were several scenes that I made sure to put in the book where there's a very big divide on what the girls do. And some of them are okay with things that others are not. And the comfortableness of them all being able to say, I'm upset about this and I didn't like this. And I felt like you should have told me that. And for them to respect each other's feelings, I think is important for anybody to see, especially as teenagers. Cause I think that's an important lesson. Everybody needs to learn that you can be honest with your friends and you should be able to have those conversations rather than, you know, burying stuff and just secretly holding grudges against your friends. So that was one of the biggest things that I really, really wanted to showcase. And then of course, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with the book, um, Cass is the main character who has escaped a kidnapper. And she, from that point on, starts to receive these letters that show that he's been watching her. So for her, she sort of seeks out these other people after she's drawn away from them for a bit because she realizes she does need other people. And so that was important too, just to get the idea across that you don't have to suffer alone, that there are people that even when it's hard to talk about, you can turn to other people and there are people willing to help you. Okay, I love that. So, I mean, really with The Lost Girls, that's very, very sort of similar theme to, to what you have. I love how our books are so completely different on totally <laughs> different genres and yet somehow, I don't know, it's crazy, <laughs> right? Uh, that we end up with such similar themes. And I think, you know, the friendship between Holly and Ida and Rose very much could have gone the way of pitting these women and girls against each other. I mean, they all shared an ex-boyfriend, right? So you so easily could have taken it where there was some sort of rivalry there and you didn't. You You made sure that they were all friends and came together. And so Tell us about that and why you did that and how you framed that within the story. Um, for for me, like I said, like earlier, all my all my books have this thread of strong female friendships in them. It's always been something that's very important to me in all my books because the way that teenage girls support each other is incredible and it is amazing. And oftentimes when they're pitted as like these hardcore rivals or these mean girls, it's not necessarily the most true or most realistic portrayal of how these friendships work. Um, girls will, I mean, go to town for each other. I mean, they'll do everything for each other and <laughs> they'll walk through fire for each other. And I like the fact that these girls at first do have, you know, they're all sharing this ex-boyfriend. So naturally it seems like they would be um, enemies or have, you know, bitterness or you know whatever anything else between them but it was essential in my story for that they have to work together to reach their goal which is you know killing him um so they have to work together they have to come together and even though they come from different time periods they have different personalities um they do all have this one guy in common and at first it seems like that's all they have in common but the more time that they spend with each other and the more that they lean on each other and rely on each other they find out they have so much more in common than they ever thought and they create sort of their own little family out of that and for me it, I wanted to showcase the women not just coming together but I wanted to showcase them taking power back into their own hands after they've been victimized by this guy and um, I think the incredible ways that that girls can come together and support each other in the amazing things that they can accomplish when they do so is, is something that I wanted to highlight in that. So yeah, that was, it was fun and, and to write too. Cause I mean, I love writing friendship stories. Friends are 
they have great banter. They have great chemistry. I just, I love it. Um, so let's see what I was going to ask you next. Um, oh yeah. So I was talking about that, that bond, when we were talking about that bonds part, um, and I'm, you know, when I was talking about my part of how important it was to show the girls, um, you know, coming together, how important was it for you to show your girls, not just standing up for themselves, but for each other as well in that, um, the way things turned out. I don't want to spoil anything. It's so hard not to say things without spoiling things. <laughs> I know there's so many things that I have to, I'm like, nope, can't say that or that or that. Um, you know, what you see as the book starts out is, you know, that Cass has really sort of removed herself from all friendships. And it's a huge point of contention between her and Margot because they used to be best friends. And then somehow pretty quickly in the book, she ends up with this whole squad of girls, right? And they all have their own separate issues. And that was important to me too, because I didn't want it to just be Cass's story. I didn't want it to just be, you know, her one thing and all these girls come together to help her. I wanted to show that each individual person has their own things and you never really know what the other person that's sitting next to you might be dealing with. Um, and, and it also gave me an opportunity to sort of show this wide variety of different things that girls might be you know, facing on a daily basis and stuff that comes up all the time. Um, so it was important to me that I showed not just this main character and her struggle and how people helped her, but then how she paid that back and how she stood up for and helped and put her things aside sometimes to help those other friends of hers so that in the end they all got what they were looking for and you know one of the things that i love because we we sort of have this i think mutual love for girls that maybe do not have the best support systems in life um and, and i think parker <laughs> was a great example of that um, and I think that's so important because she's such a critical person in the book and she becomes an awesome Holly love interest in the end. That's a little spoiler, <laughs> but like, so why was that important to you? And, and what kind of things did you take care to do in writing a person like that? And why was it important for you to show how these people who maybe had made some of those mistakes and saw her headed down that same path how did they, you know, come around and, and help her and stop her from doing what they had done? Um, so it's like, for me, I'm always going, I think I'm just always going to write girls that are feeling just a little bit on the fringes of, you know, and they may a little bit on the, they're not, I'm generally don't write like, you know, the girl that has the loving family and everything is great for her. And she's, she's very well loved yep. by many people. Um, <laughs> One day I'll write a book with parents that are awesome, like not today, but <laughs> not, not today. Um, so I, I generally uh, are gravitate towards writing characters who, um, feel out of place and feel a little bit lost in the world, which, ha, uh, the title, um, but is it, it's mainly, um, because I want to give girls that don't have support systems, you know, necessarily in their lives, I want to give them happy endings. I want to give them adventure. I want to give them moments of triumph. And I think that these are the stories that I also gravitated towards, you know, to when I was a teen. So, um, and even, you know, before that. So I'm, for me, it was always important to showcase girls that when, you know, the rest of the world says you're not likable, I'm going to say, you know what, you deserve to be loved anyway. You deserve to be loved because of who you are, not just, you know, in spite of it. So, um, yeah, so that was, you know, that's just kind of like a theme that runs through all my stories. And especially this one, it was like very much so like, I'm just going to unleash it all in this story so <laughs> I was like sitting here typing and I'm like this sometimes feels like I'm putting too much of myself into it a little bit but at the same time that's kind of what creating is you kind of you kind of have to do that to really make it feel real yeah no I and you did such a fantastic job I mean it, and it showed I think it shows when when you really understand a character and what they're facing and you know I loved Parker, you know, I, you know, I love all your characters, right? <laughs> but so you, you mentioned one of my 
favorite topics, unlikable female characters. Um, yes, always. Love. <laughs> uh, and and you, you mentioned that the whole point of the story, right, is that Holly and Ida and Rose have to kind of come together and they have to kill their ex-boyfriend, basically, in order for all of this to work out. So, I mean, there are a few things that make a female character more unlikable than having to premeditated kill someone, regardless of what they've done, right? So, I mean, did that enter into your thought process at all? And did you do anything to sort of address that? Or was there any sort of concerns with writing a character whose main goal ends up being a premeditated murder, essentially? Um, I think, I'm going to be honest, I didn't have any hesitancy about it at all. <laughs> I mean, I, oh, I, I love it. that this dude had to die. So <laughs> I was just like, you know what, we're doing this. And I think it, throughout the story that I highlighted very strongly why this was a necessary thing. And, and I think that this nece wouldn't necessarily work as well if this were a straight contemporary story and they're just killing a random guy, but they are vampires and they are killing another vampire. So this, you know, and the vampire is a bad dude and a predator and he kills lots of pizza people himself. So, um, I didn't cry for him. Yes. <laughs> I do think though, that I did try to, um, keep it, you know, very clear on why this was a necessary thing to do, but I didn't have any hesitancy <laughs> on that at all. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. I'm like, maybe I should feel bad, but I'm like, nah, I don't. He deserved it. <laughs> Listen, I'd be worried about somebody who said he didn't have it coming by the end of the book. Right. And 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 even at the end of the book, she was just like, I, I regret nothing. I have no regrets where this is concerned. And I think that that was important for her arc as well, which I can't, again, get into too much because of spoilers. But right. I do want to say that that at the start of the story, she is very weighed down and heavily burdened by her regrets and learning to forgive herself and let go of the mistakes that she has made and understand that it's okay to forgive yourself when you mess up, I think is one of her most important arts in the story. So at the end, when she has no regrets over this, I think that that was an important step for her. And again, it's you know, he's a vampire, so she's not out there like killing a real dude or anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask you then, since we're talking about revenge and all of this, why do you think teens react so strongly to revenge plots? And is there some commentary that can be made about character agency leading to eventual justice that's so often lacking in the real world? <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I think you kind of touched on this a little bit early, just in terms of like how much control teens have over their lives. And the truth is, it's really not much, right? Just, you know, here's Holly stuck in this world where she can't, she can't buy a car, she can't get her own apartment, she can't really support herself because she's forever stuck in this teen limbo. And I think for a lot of teenagers, it is that sort of middle zone where they're old enough to have their own opinions they're old enough to understand a little bit more of the world and what they want to be in it and what it means for them but they really don't have many opportunities to make that happen and so I think that's a big part of why you know so many teens look at like revenge stories and they feel like finally we get to see this example of somebody who despite not having any control over their lives really is able to break through that and still bring justice to people in the end and i i think there's probably a huge amount of correlation really to what a lot of people experience in the real world and what we get to see in books because honestly a lot of times there's not that happy ending when it comes to things that happen to teenagers, right? Their concerns get pushed under the rug or it's, you know, you'll understand when you get older. And I think, you know, YA in general gives them a voice and gives them an opportunity to see those issues given the weight that they deserve rather than sort of ignored or just kind of, you know, nice little pat on the back and don't worry, you know, you'll, you'll get over it. It's not that big of a deal, but when you're that age, it's a huge deal. And I, I think, that's a huge element of 
why so many teenagers love a story that has that kind of thing in there where there's main characters are able to persevere and get the justice that maybe they might not get if this were a real life. For sure. And teens are, they care about justice. They care about doing the right thing. They care about you know, balancing those scales a lot. So if, if this is being played out for them fictionally in these stories where they are the heroes and they get that power, it's, it's very empowering, even if, it, even if it's characters who are considered quote unquote unlikable doing, you know, these things, it's, it's extremely gratifying sometimes, at least it was to me when I was a teen, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, yep, absolutely. And so, no, I have to get this question in before Samantha comes back and cuts this off. <laughs> okay, so if you were stuck at a teenager for the rest of your life, what would be the one like style or physical thing that you would hate the most? Oh my gosh, you know what? I did have an answer prepared for, okay, here's <laughs> what's, here's what happened. I when I was, and this was when I was 18. So I was technically an adult and I should have known better, Close enough. But, <laughs> but I went to great clips and for $10, oh. I asked for mm. the Rachel <laughs> and I had the worst regrets I've ever had. I got sort of like a, like a shaggy mullet sort of with bangs. Oh. Please and tell I me there are pictures of this person. somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I do have I actually do have a glamour shot of me with that hairstyle, which with a leather jacket. Seen. Yes. yes. <laughs> which you've seen. So Can we that put that the... in the chat. Can we add that as a link in the bottom of this? Video? I don't even know what happened to it. I think I deleted it off my phone. But <laughs> deleted it. Um, but yeah, so that was um the quite the tragedy. And if I returned as a vampire and stuck with that particular hairstyle for the rest of my life, I would be devastated. It took years to grow out. <laughs> and I had my I had all these clips and in my hair all like, trying to pin oh, some of it back. No. And yeah, it was not not good times for me. See, I think mine would probably be as long as I was not in the one time one time in my life where I decided to dye my hair. I don't know if you've ever looked at the side of a box color, but red is not really an option of a before. And so I was like, this will totally work. And I, it was kind of like a purple magenta sort of look by the end. Thank God it did not stay long, but for a while there it was, um, yeah, that would have been tragic. <laughs> Can I ask this next kind of question? Sure. I'm going to ask it of both of you because that's who it's for. If you could build a fictional girl gang, who would be in it? Who would be in it? Yeah. Who would be in your fictional gang of girls? Like real people I know? I, I think fictional characters. Oh, fictional oh, no. characters. Oh, geez. Oh, this is going to be hard pressure yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> Sonia goes first Sonia's the <laughs> oh my gosh I it's a really I, good it's a really good question it's a really good it question. is a good question yes. I'm I suddenly mm -hmm. forgot every book I've ever read I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay how I'm about we do this oh go ahead I'm sorry I'm gonna put together a fictional girl gang of all of my friends books <laughs> that are right behind Andrea there. <laughs> I do have so many of them. I've got All of those characters. Quick over here. Those okay, are how, all in how my about, girl gang. How about we do it this way? How about of characters that you have written? Characters that you, I've written? Yes. Okay. Well, I would bring all my vampire girls together because they're amazing and they can handle a lot of, um, the like physical fights if needed if we're like in a zombie <laughs> apocalypse type situation Always and then good I would to bring have. yeah I would bring um Cece from my debut have a little faith in me because um she is she's amazing so she comes and <laughs> she comes along she's in the gang just because she's awesome and I would also bring Macy for the same reason who's in my second book not your love story um and then I would also bring Midnight who was in not your love story because she was also an awesome character and I'd probably want to bring all the cabin eight girls from have a little faith in me too I would have a giant 
girl gang. Like it would be amazing. I would not invite anybody from my adult novel because my adults would not want to hang out with teenagers and my teenagers wouldn't want to hang out with my adults. They would be like, yeah, no. <laughs> so they would, they have totally different <laughs> lives and paths and goals, but all the girls from my YA novels, I'd want them together. I love it. Andrea, how about you? Oh gosh. I mean, I think for all of them, um, <laughs> Caroline from my debut, obviously just because she's just a total badass and was not afraid to do things that she shouldn't have. Um, not afraid to not play by the rules, not by any stretch. Um, she kind of knew what she wanted and she was going to make it happen regardless of what stood in her way. Um, and, and Aubrey for the same reason, just because she was always the voice of reason. You always need one of those in any girl gang to say, okay, you know, y'all let's maybe leave some logic here. Um, and, and I think, I'd bring all four of my girls from Out of the Fire just because they all have such a great mix of personalities. Um, and probably most importantly, even though he's technically a boy, I would bring Nomi's dog, Salvador Doggy, um, because every girl gang needs a mascot. So Sal would definitely be in the mix there too. I love it. Um, okay, I have some rapid fire questions if you're ready. Yes. You ready? All right. Sonia, you're going to go first on these. Um, coffee <laughs> or tea? Uh, tea. Andrea? Tea. Um, what is the last book you read, Sonia? Oh, my God. What is the last? Oh, boys, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Andrea? Oh, um, I want, was it? Yeah, The Hunting Party by Lucy Foley. It's right back here. Um, Sonia, what was the first job you ever had? Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. Andrea? Uh, I was a waitress at Big Boy, which sounds terrible, but I worked with my friends, so it was only like half terrible. Um, would you, Sonia, would you explore the ocean or outer space? Outer space. I'm obsessed with outer space. Obsessed with it. I look up stuff online about outer space all the time. I love it. That's awesome. Andrea? <laughs> Dude, listen, the ocean is terrifying. Um, <laughs> it, it is. Did you, there was this something where they just, they, you know, poor crocodiles, right? But they took some crocodiles and like dropped them in the ocean with weights and one of them just disappeared. Like they, they had, just gone. So they hypothesized that some massive ocean creature just came and take took the whole thing away. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere in the ocean. I'll launch myself on a rocket. They can keep their squid monsters. I love it. Um, are you a car, an airplane, or a boat? Oh, um. <laughs> I'm an airplane. I'm going to call myself an airplane because I've always wanted to fly. So I love that reason. Andrea, how about you? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a total airplane. Um, it's so much faster and I really don't have the patience for car rides or boat rides. I just, I get like a half hour and then I'm thinking of all the other things I should be doing. I love it. Um, all right, ladies, I want to know what's next for both of you. Sonia, what's next for you? Um, right now, I am drafting, so <laughs> nothing but that. <laughs> <laughs> but I usually don't talk about my drafting projects while I'm doing it because I'm just weird and superstitious. So I generally wait until they're done before I can talk about them. So um, things are happening. That's all. <laughs> we will wait to hear then. How about you, Andrea? Well, I'm supposed to be drafting, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, I, <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm totally drafting if my agent or editor are watching this. Um, no, I have Out of the Fire that comes out on October 19th, so just not even a full month away. Um, and then I have another book that comes out with Scholastic in 2022, fall sometime, which is tentatively titled Tell Me No Lies. Nice. And then how does everyone find you to follow you to find out about these next projects? Um, I'm on Twitter at Sonia Hartle one and I'm on Instagram at Hartle Sonia. 
and um, I am technically on Facebook, but not really ever there. So I'm just not going to share that one. <laughs> and then my website is soniahartle.com. Perfect. And Andrea, how do they follow you? Yeah, website has all the links if you need it, but it's andreacontos.com. Twitter is Andrea Contos and Instagram, I believe it's Andrea underscore Contos. But if you know, you get the first part of it and you'll find the rest. Perfect. I want to thank you both for joining us this evening. Um, I did drop the links for the signed copies of Sonia Hurdle's new book, Lost Girls, a vampire revenge story um, in the chat there. So be sure to grab your copy if you haven't already and we will get those out. Um, it's, we had some publishing shipping delays. So as soon as we get those, we will get them out to you. Um, we hope you all had a wonderful evening. And if you tuned in late, we will drop this recording on our Facebook and our YouTube channel for you to check out later. So thank you, ladies. I hope you had thank a good you. time. I hope everyone watching had a good time and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.